Thank you. Wow. Now that's some serious music. Thank you all so much. Thank you. A, a few years ago, I met a guy um, on some business trip. And uh, for some reason, I, of course, I tell everybody I'm the pastor of the New Hope Church, whatever I'm doing. And this guy looked at me, he says, well, I'm an atheist. I don't know what he's expecting me to do, like I'd be upset or mad or whatever. But I just said, well, tell me what kind of God you think he is. And after he went off all of his information and so forth, I said, you know what? If that was God, I'd be an atheist too. The caricatures people have of God are totally different from what's pretended in the Bible. And today, we've been looking for the last several weeks about attributes of God. Today, we're on the attribute of love. Until you realize how much God loves you, you really don't know God at all. He loves us with unending love. In 1 John 4.16, we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. You've got to get that in your heart. God is love. He really cares about you. you know, now, consider this, though. God is love, but it's not love is God. You say, well, what's the difference? It's kind of like, you know, my dog is a girl, and, or my girl is a dog. You know, that's a whole different story there. <laughs> Way different. Now, some people try to avoid God because they, they stay away from, like, the plague. Oh, that's the church. I'm going to stay away from that place. Oh, you're a preacher. Oh, I'm, I'm out of here. Because they don't know God. They don't know who really we represent. They have this caricature that is totally wrong. Now, why do people avoid God? I'm going to give you three reasons. And I've heard a thousand of them. This is just three of them I'm going to give you. First, fear that I'm going to give up my fun. See, if I'm a Christian, then it's over. I'm done. No more fun. No more laughing. Just a bunch of sour prunes. I will say, sometimes you go to a church and they just have a bunch of wet blankets that will put every fire out, you know, and just kill it down. Well, you're in the wrong place then. Sometimes they think, well, spiritual, that equals miserable. And I don't want to be miserable. I want fun. I want enjoyment. Great. So we don't want to give up our fun. You know, the TV, all their advertisements, they really put forth the mindset of what fun is. They say, go for the gusto. You know, it's kind of like, uh, do I want to have Miller time or do I want to go to Sunday school? Well, you know, it's kind of, Miller time looks like more fun than Sunday school as far as those commercials are. Problem. Happiness can be brought for a while, then what happens? Then you've got to get something else kind of wears out, so then you've got to go get something else and try it. Just like, I love to travel. I went this past year to Yellowstone, never been there. It's absolutely amazing in Yellowstone. So I enjoy making trips, enjoy having a good time. But here's the problem. If you live for those things, eventually what happens, you're going to get burned out. Why? I call these things artificial sweeteners. They look good. It's a quick fix, but it has very diminishing returns. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 23, the blessings of the Lord make a person rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. God says, I'm not, I'm not here to make your life sorrowful. I want you to have an abundant life. You know, think about it. Many years ago, I'm, I'm 66, okay? Many years ago when I was about 20 years old, you, know, you go to a singles bar. There's nothing more phony than a singles bar, you realize that. People, they acting like they're having fun. And where else would you go to walk up to a total stranger and say, hey, can I buy you a drink? 
you know, you're at the you're at the department store and you look around and say, hey, do you want a toaster? I'll buy you a toaster. That's about the same difference. <laughs> Let me give you a fact. In First Timothy one uh, six verse seventeen. God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So God wants you to have fun. He wants you to have an enjoyable life. He doesn't want you to walk around in a hole in the ground and have no fun. Consider this. Notice about Jesus' critics. Matthew 11 and verse 19. The Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners, but wisdom is shown to be right by the results. See, they were mad at him. He, see, some, quote, people think, well, if you're spiritual, you just hang around with, quote, spiritual people. Jesus, the Son of God, says, no, I want to be with all the people. You know, it doesn't matter what their occupation or where they've been. Jesus says, by his actions and by his words, he says, I love them. I care about them. They're not going to be ostracized from me at all. You know, I, have a, I enjoy life. Nobody has more fun than me. I have a great time. I just follow the Lord and enjoy life, and it's great. The second fear, that I'll become what? A fanatic. Hmm. Fanatic. These crazy people, yes. These are often misguided, sometimes nice people, but misguided. And we tend to avoid them because they seem to be fanatics. I wrote down a few names that I would use to describe them. You have Freddie the Pharisee, rigid, narrow-minded, legalistic, has a rule for everything, and he'll make up a rule. If there's not a rule, he'll find a rule. And his favorite word is don't, yes. Then there's Susie's self-righteous. Holy with no attitude, judgment of others. The favorite phrase is, thank you, God, I'm not you. You go, well, thanks a bunch. <laughs> then you got Billy the Bible thumper, obnoxious, zealous, crusader. If it's moving, he'll convert it. His favorite word is turn or burn. He wants to get that right. They have Pauline, the praise and hallelujah person. She can't speak without using religious cliches. You know, cliches there. She says, believe, receive, right? Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Oh, I had a wreck. Praise God. <laughs> hallelujah, you had a bad day. No, that, that's, that doesn't work for me. I don't know about you. You know, here's a fact. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. He says, I want you to have a full and enjoyable life. You realize Jesus' hardest criticism was against religious individuals. We call them the Pharisees. So what did he... Now here he comes up to these, quote, religious people. And you have that in Matthew 23, 1 through 6. You can read it later. I'll just give you a few of the things that were there. He says, you know what? You're a bunch of white tombs, painted and beautiful on the outside, but inside you're just a bunch of dead men's bones. You go, wow, yeah. He says, here's another one. He said, you guys will go out and strain a gnat, but you're going to swallow a camel. Jesus had no time for self-righteous religious people. He says, just get out of here. Why? They wanted to keep people away from God by all the rules and regulations. And Jesus says, no, I love them. I want them to come home to me. So here's another fear. Fear, number three, that I'll lose my freedom. Hmm. Yeah, i got to watch that. We don't want to lose our freedom. The world defines freedom as life without restraint. Do whatever you want, no consequences. Nobody's telling me yes or no, I'll do as I please. That's the attitude. 
you know, some parents worry about what is written in rap songs today. While they love to hear Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. You realize Frank Sinatra, he had five divorces. I mean, he had all kinds of problems in life, but he did it his way. So don't criticize one without realizing where you are. Watch the lyrics. You know, realize sexual freedom has given us what? AIDS, social diseases, many abortions. The chemical industry is incredibly damaging to us. There's, we have the most society, our United States, is more on drugs than any other nation per capita in the world. It is terrible, the plague of fentanyl and other chemicals. And then, well, I have freedom to take it. Yeah, but it's putting holes in your brain. It's destroying your family. It's destroying your home. There is no hope in it. Oh, but it makes me feel good. Yeah, but you feel good for a while. Then what do you have to do? Take some more and take some more. And before you know it, you're broke. You have no friends. You have nothing. It's an empty place to be. So you know, we have freedom of choice, but not freedom from the consequences of those choices. So you need to make wise choices. And John 8, 34. Then the entire town came out to meet Jesus, but they begged him to go away and leave them alone. You go, what is that? Jesus and his disciples came over off the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a big lake, to the gatherings. And there was a man there that nobody liked. And he was naked. He was hitting himself against the tombs. He just lived among the graves. And he was totally out of his mind because he was possessed. Jesus commanded the evil spirit, who called themselves legion, to leave. And they went into the pigs and went on. And then Jesus had him clothed and had him sitting in his right mind. And the townspeople came out and go, oh, go away from us. We don't want to be around you. They go, what was going on? They saw this man healed and the evil spirit gone, and they were afraid maybe they were going to, something was going to happen to them. And so Jesus got ready to leave, and the man who had been healed said, hey, I want to go with you too. I don't want to be these crazy people. And Jesus said, no, you go and tell them what I've done for you. And so Jesus left. And when he came back, after a little while, he came back, and what happened? Everybody greeted Jesus because that man went around telling everybody how Jesus loved him and how he didn't give up on him and how he healed him, and you need to know Jesus too. Total transformation. They had all this fear, and it was wiped away by God's love. So, real freedom, not phony freedom. Let me give you one other. 1 John 1, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. So, the antidote to fear is recognize how much God loves you. The more you realize God loves you, what happens? The more that fear goes away. Do you realize how much God loves you? So, doing that, you realize that you're not going to become a fanatic. You're not going to become some self-righteous, horrible person. No, you can be a loving person who forgives and let things go. You know, so many times we just need to let things roll off and love and move on. Let other people handle that. You know, God, Jesus is not a cruel God. He's a loving God. He cares for you. You realize on Easter Sunday, what's the first words that came out of his mouth? Fear not. Fear not. And we didn't know, don't fear God, know that he loves you. Don't be afraid. So therefore, how much does God love me? So that comes out of that. We say, oh yeah, he know, loves those people, loves these, but yeah, what about me? Well, let's look at it. In Ephesians 3, 17 and 18, I pray that you'll grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ. 
Now we're going to look at those four things. How wide, how long, how high and deep is what? The love of God. We look in Psalms. Let me see. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Ephesians 3. Yeah. Okay, here is. I, I'm, getting, I'm getting in between. You got these lines in your glasses, and you're going, what are, where am I on this? Yes. See, you got to laugh. When you get older, you got to laugh at yourself because you you know, when you're young, you get all stressed out and you sweat and you go, oh, you're going to laugh. No, never, yeah, just laugh. I'm wide and God's love is wide enough to include everyone. God's love is wide enough to include everyone. Yes, even me, even you, even some other people that you may not like. God loves them. Consider this. Psalms 145, verse 17. The, love, the Lord is loving toward all he has made. No, all. Now, our English, you know, go through and take English. They, they tell us, don't use all this words because there's always an exception. Well, God uses all this word because there is no exception. God loves all he has made. There's nobody that God has made that he doesn't love. The good news is God loves me. The bad news is the other side is he loves your enemies too. <laughs> I don't like them. What does God say? Pray for your enemies. Well, I don't want to pray for them. God says pray for them. I don't care. I love them too. Jesus loved the unlovely. And then you realize he loved the unlovely, and that's what got him in trouble with the, quote, religious people. See, you always got to watch out for, quote, religious people. I, see, I'm committed to Jesus. I'm a, he's my Savior. I have my relationship with him. Religious people have all the rules and regulations, everything you can do, can't do, when you can do it, how, for, you got. Like in, back in that day, they said, well, you, you couldn't carry a burden on, on the Sabbath, on Sunday. Okay, so they started dragging a burden. Oh, but you can only drag a burden so many feet in, on, on the Sabbath. And you'll look in the Bible, it talks about a Sabbath day's walk. Well, they said on the Sabbath, you can only walk so many steps. So like when you go to Israel, the elevators on the, on the Sabbath, what, what do they got? All the buttons are punched. You said, well, who's the guy that got in there and punched all those things? On their Sabbath, all the buttons are pushed because that way, because it's work to push a button for an elevator to go. Yeah, so you get in the elevator and you go up and down, whatever, it stops on every floor. That, that's what religion does. It has rules and regulation. It's devoid of love. And God says, I love you with all of my heart. And the things that God wants us to do are only good for us. And the things he doesn't want us to do are bad for us. So it's kind of like, which way you want to go? I want good things to come into my life. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who had released on him would not perish but have everlasting life. You know, it says he loved the world. He loves everyone. No matter what you've done or where you've been, even if everybody has given up on you, God hasn't. You can come home to him. Number two, God's love is long enough to last forever. That's another, another allness word, forever. Then say, God love you until. No. Forever. In Jeremiah 31, verse 3, God says, I love you with what? Everlasting love. So even on your really good days, God loves you. Even on your really bad days, God loves you. There's even a song about that. On my good days, God loves me. On my bad days, it doesn't matter. God loves me all the time. In Psalm 69, verse 2, 
God's love will last for all time. There's no ending to it. God is eternal. There's a different kind of love that, about human love. You realize human love at times wears out. That's why there's so many divorces that love wore out. You know, when I'm doing some marriage counseling, I always ask them, yeah, I say, yeah they love, it. love each other great. Okay, but do you like each other? You know, well, I don't like this, I don't like that. No. Let's work on you liking one another because you say you already love one another. Let's work on that, okay? You know, a lot of people have great opportunities and they miss them because they don't realize how much God loves them. We need God's love in our marriages. Frankly, we need God's love in our business relationships. Because everywhere you go, you got business, you got relationships. Be it you at the ball game when you're watching the kids play, or you're going to the Astros and watching them play, or you're out conducting business, working with the people. Now, some people say, well, I don't like politics. You know what? If you have people, you have politics. I don't care whether it's at the ballpark or it's at the Senate or wherever you're going to have. You get a group of people together, there'll be different opinions. But we never give up. Never give up. Keep loving people. Realize God has not given up on loving you, so you don't give up on loving other people. But that doesn't mean that you allow people to condemn you to hurt you. You've already hurt you. There's a limit. You go, okay, I, I love you, but no, you can't hurt me anymore. It doesn't mean you have to capitulate to somebody who's doing wrong. You know, as the Bible teaches about, you know, sometimes love's got to be tough. But you, you, you're tough because you love them. It's kind of like, over here, I love children, but this baptistry has a gate. <laughs> because I know what little two-year-old little boys do. Girls to some extent, but boys are the worst. If I had that full of water and there's no gate there, I'm preaching along, what's going to happen? Somebody's going to do a belly flop in the baptistry. <laughs> and the scary thing is, it could be, they may get in there, we may not see them, and then it's not a good ending. So I love kids, so I've got a gate there. When I, when I was having that thing put in there, the guy said, what do you need a gate for? I said, because I'm not going to have a little one in that baptistry. Yeah. You've got you to you care. And three, God's love is high enough to be everywhere. It's no limit. I like Romans 8, 39. Neither height or depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's one of the most powerful verses to me. Neither height or depth. No matter, you know, you realize when you're at a great victory, you could be just preparing for a defeat. You realize that. You get to the top of the mountain and you fall off. And sometimes you get real low and you go, I'm lower than God. No, God's underneath you holding me up still. Nor anything else in all of creation. And somebody will say, well, these people kept me from God. Well, they can't because nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can keep you from that. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's no place we can go that God hasn't already been or will be. There's no circumstance or situation that you get into that God doesn't go, what, what was that? You know, sometimes you think we're going to surprise God. So we don't want to pray about it because we're in a big mess and we don't want to talk to God about it. I hate to break this to you. He already knows. He's not going to go, well, by golly, I never heard of that before. He already knows. So what you do, you confess it and then move on because he loves you. So it's not a rule or regulation or some man's pronouncement that makes us do really right. It's knowing that we're 
greatly loved by God himself, and we want God to show our love back to him. So that's why we do as we should. Not because we have to, but because we want to. You know, if you're married, one of you is going to die before the other one. And you're going to grieve. But even though you're grieving and your spouse is gone, what happened? God is there with you, so you're never really alone. He's there to help you. So I'm not talking about religion. Religion is comes today, tomorrow, this way. I'm talking about relationship with Jesus Christ, who loves you and cares about you regardless of what you face. His love lasts forever, and his love is everywhere. And four, God's love is deep enough to meet all my needs. You say, well, I don't know what, you know, you don't know what all my needs are. I don't know, and I don't need to know, because God knows your needs. In Psalms 1817, he rescued me from powerful enemies. You may have been through life and you had some people that didn't like you at all. He says, he rescued me from powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. He says, it doesn't matter who you're facing. God says, I'm there with you. In Psalms 109, verse 22, for I'm poor and needy and my heart is full of pain. You may have felt that way sometimes. You're just really beaten down. In Psalms 40, verse 11, My only hope is your love. For my problems are too big for me to solve and are piled up over my head. If you've ever been in a bad situation, you go, well, how am I going to get out of this one? You know what? You did. You're here today. Because the more you look at the problem, what happens? The worse it gets. You've got to focus on your love of God and deal with something one day at a time. See, when we get into a problem, we want to swallow the whole elephant. We want to take on the whole problem, deal with it, and get it over with real quick because I don't want to deal with it anymore. No. You deal with it one day at a time. And it's amazing how you deal with it one day at a time, trusting God to help you through that, how he removes things you thought were going to be bad for you, and suddenly they're gone. And it's because God caused that to happen. What troubles we get into? Despair, deep stress, emotional problems, financial problems. You know, the most likely cause of marriage collapse is actually financial issues. And so you need to manage your money well, but who helps you manage that well? Our Heavenly Father. So you make decisions in your life with his love and what happens, you wind up managing your money better because you love God and God gives you the wisdom how to make wise decisions with that. And let me give you this. God's love is far deeper than we, we can imagine. You, you most likely have heard of Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy Ten Boom. They were Christians in the Netherlands. They hid Jews from the Nazis, but eventually they were found out, and they took the Jews and the Ten Boom family to the prisons, to the concentration camps. And after watching a whole bunch of atrocities happening there, Corey told Pepsi, this place is a pit of hell. And Betsy replied, there is no pit too deep that God's love isn't there. Betsy wound up dying in the concentration camp. Corey lived to tell the story. Because God's love never gave up on her. And some of you may have hit rock bottom at times. You know, financially you say, I'm broke, I'm, I'm at the bottom of rung. You say, may say, my marriage is hitting on the bottom rung. I want you to know, God can put things back together 
He can change things if you let him. In Deuteronomy 32, 27, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath you are his everlasting arms. So when you hit rock bottom, who's there? God. You're dropping into his arms of love, and he's there to lift you back up. Let him catch you. You know, the, the thing about God, we think at times, oh, I'm so far away from God, I can never get back to him. You take one step back towards God, and what happens? He's there. <laughs> you know, either you got noisy kids in church, or you don't have kids in church. And I love noisy kids, so bring them on. Bring them on. When you look at these four things, how high God is, how depth his love is, the length of his love and the width of his love, you have all the dimensions of God's love. They're beyond whatever you can do. This is not in your notes, but I want to give you John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends, Jesus said. At the cross, he laid down his life to pay for our sins. He didn't give up on us. He didn't say, oh, the world's so bad, I'm going to do away with them. No, he says, I love them. In Romans 5, 8, but God has shown how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, at the cross, we said, well, how much does God love me? He stretched down his hands. He says, I love you so much. It hurts. You know, he could have at any time said, hey, I'm out of here. I'm going back to heaven. I want to put up with this. I didn't commit these sins, but he stayed on the cross for us. For us. You know, re rejecting God's love, you're only hurting yourself. Receive his love and he transforms your life. You know, the fact is, every one of us came for different reasons. You know, some people came, uh, this is what they do on a Sunday morning. Other people came, well, you know, I, I want to come, come to, I'm here on Christmas and Easter, so here I am. <laughs> That's okay. Others came, I just want to check out this church here on the road. Others came because you were invited by a friend. It doesn't matter where you came or how you came, God says, I want you in this place today to hear this message. That you are loved by God far more than you can ever imagine. He knew a thousand years before that you would be here in this place, and you're here for a reason. You know, say, I want to be close to God. I say to you, you're as close as you want to be. You really are. And if you feel like you've been away from God, hey, take that step back. You, God's not going to, he's going to work with you what? Where you are. Not where you want to be. You know what? I know I'm not where I need to be yet. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person in progress every day. All of us are there. That's why we can relate. We all need help. We all need to move closer to God. And what happens? We're serving a loving God, and we got a child with a great big voice. He'll probably be a preacher. <laughs> yes. We love children. In Isaiah 54, verse 7, God says, With deep love, I will take you back. Where well, other people may not take you back. Other people say, You're done. I don't want any more of you. Get out of here. God says, I love you. And it doesn't matter how far you go or where you've been, God says, I will never give up on you. So how do we do that? You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and ask him to forgive your sins and ask him to be your Savior, your Lord of your life, and watch how he, he will transform you. We call that being born again. And that's what Easter is all about. You realize... 
Christmas has no meaning whatsoever without Easter. If, if, if there was just Christmas, okay, the Savior won't come, okay, that's great. We love that. We celebrate. We rid that in our house. But if Easter hadn't happened, if the resurrection hadn't happened, uh, let me just, let's just go home, go play golf, or go to the races, or go out and pick flowers. Because there would be no hope. It would simply be, that's it. You die, there is no hope. But because he rose from the grave, and we celebrate it this day, we have hope beyond our imagination. So know Jesus. Know the reason for Easter. Know the reason for the Resurrection Sunday. And let God transform your life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us never to reject your love. Help us not build on religion, but on our relationship with you. That we may live with you daily. Know of your presence daily. And show your love to others daily, just as you give us your love. I pray with all my heart, Father, as you hear us now, you know what we're thinking, you know our thoughts. There's no secret formula or fancy words. It's an attitude of our heart. And we come to you with a heart open wide, knowing that we are loved beyond our imagination. And we can be forgiven. And we should never be afraid of you because you don't cast anyone out that comes to you. You love them. As billions of people around celebrate this tremendous event today, we join with them, Father. Yes, Jesus is risen from the grave. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand for this time of invitation.